that? Okay, so we have our uh, beer sponsor here. This is the man that actually paid for the beer. So, um, yeah, thank you. you. Alright, so, says with Smash Metrics, why don't you give us a little overview of what exactly your company does and uh, everything that's going on? Yeah, so we're a digital strategy and conversion rate optimization firm. So, basically, we help businesses achieve their business objectives on the digital channels like social media as well as on their websites. And uh, we help them get people to come to their sites that are ready to buy. And then we help them once they get to that site to make sure that they're actually purchasing and, and becoming customers. Okay, and it looks like uh, some of the partners you've had have been pretty big names, right? You've got Zappos and Walmart and Sam's Club in there. And... Yeah, so um, our partners and employees, we've all worked with some of the biggest brands in the, in the world and uh, had some really great experiences helping them build technology, uh, whether it's for mobile or, or uh, social channels as well as e-commerce. What we wanted to do is offer anyone in Vegas Tech or Downtown uh, project the opportunity to have a free strategy session with us. So we offer a lot of different things like conversion rate optimization where people can learn how to really help convert their visitors into to sales. And so we're going to offer free strategy sessions and they can check that out on our website at smashmetrics.com forward slash downtown project. Okay, so be good for startups and basically yeah. companies of all sizes too? Exactly. Anyone not, just, not just the Walmarts out there? Exactly. Okay, well, you, you don't Most of these to... guys have companies bigger than that, but exactly. just making sure. So, okay, so everybody check out smashmetrics.com and that's the same for the Facebook and the Twitter, S-M-A-S-H-M-E-T-R-I-C-S. -S. Yep. Thank you very much. I appreciate you guys for the <laughs>
and they were operating it for about two months and they were seeing ridiculous numbers, like wow. unbelievable numbers, like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars being traded on, you know, on a monthly basis. Really? When they wanted to scale their business, like they wanted to pop it in Montreal, they wanted to pop it in, uh, in Toronto and Ontario and Calgary, they looked at their numbers, they tried to, pro you know, they, they, they ran some simple performance and they realized, holy cow, you know, we're going to have to pay $1,000 in rent plus $5,000 at the very minimum in employment costs. We're looking at 72 k per year per storefront. We can throw up a Bitcoin, we can throw up a Robocoin and do that for 18.5 and make more money and have it open at all times of the day. So it's, uh, it's, it's really cool to see like, where we're at right now. So we just, like three weeks ago, we just announced. Okay. And <laughs> Sam, our, my boy right there is, he, uh, the press genius, but evidently I know this uh, Robocoin's right. pretty exciting. all the way to us, yeah. It's, yeah, that's exactly right. It's not easy. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, we, we, we announced and within three weeks we had over 225 inquiries for sales oh, across cool. the yeah. globe, like from Zimbabwe to Argentina to Kenya to Australia. <laughs> uh, all over the world. I, it was it was it was unprecedented. So we have our first five going up in uh, December, and our first one actually, our first like kind of beta. I shouldn't even say beta, but like our first live one goes up in Vancouver in October fourteenth. Okay. Yes. Any plans to bring one to Vegas yet? Oh, we're Anybody working on it. Okay. No, yeah, we've got some. We have some, some interested with operators. Grand, right? No, no. It, it, I mean, who doesn't have that? Come on. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. It's uh, no for for United States operations. You actually do have to be registered as a money service business and licensed in the state as a money transmitter. So that's kind of a bit of an arduous process, especially getting started in the U.S. With the U.S. federal government declaring that Bitcoin is a virtual currency, we're kind of sitting in a really interesting position that. The U.S. federal government is basically saying, we'll play ball as long as you play ball. Mm -hmm. and, and, and as RoboCoin, we're really interested in leading that conversation. We're interested in being you know, kind of that, that white knight, if you will. It's really important for us to, you know, to, to be awesome and to, you know, yeah. yeah. OK, so let's throw the conversation over to Julian. And uh, you want to take it from here? Yeah, so uh, we have our resident Bitcoin correspondent, Julian. We've That's had him right, on the show yeah. a few times. And Redeems he was our main. Yeah, he was our main interview guest on episode 26 as well. And uh, he's going to give us some updated news for Bitcoins in Vegas. Yeah, well, touching on, on what uh, Jordan had said, um, you know, the, the U.S. has accepted Bitcoin. Um, that came from a federal judge in Texas saying that Bitcoin is a, is a, a private currency and, like, it's the real deal. So it was a related to a SEC um, complaint filed against somebody that was running a Ponzi scheme. Oh. And uh, so anyway, that, that ruling that it was a... A legitimate private currency came out of that from that judge. In, That's in really Texas. interesting. Yeah. But I hear you're actually going to be giving away some I am, I am giving away. Why don't you tell us about that? So what I do is uh, I organize uh, a group of about 60 people in Las Vegas that understand Bitcoin, like it, and like to buy and sell and trade and get right. involved in it. Anyway, um, what we do every week on Wednesdays is we get together and do a lunch mob and show up at a merchant and try and get them to accept Bitcoin. Oh, nice. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so that's that's what bitcoinsinvegas.com is, um, and so to promote this, I would like to reach out to you guys and use some of your re resources and um, uh, contacts. I would like to give you guys a hundred dollars in bitcoins. Um, yeah, and uh, through that, I want to I want to see if you guys know any merchants that uh, might possibly benefit from using bitcoins. So I'll give out the bitcoins next show. We'll talk about your experience with. Uh, using them, uh, handling them, whatever, and, and talk about uh, contacts that you have, merchants, businesses in town that uh, might want to use Bitcoins and, and kind of extend the network through you guys. Fantastic. Right. What do they need to do to get these Bitcoins? Okay, so uh, you're going to have to go to, uh, you're going to have to download a wallet. There's a bunch of different options. The easiest one is, uh, um, uh, the one my favorite is Mycelium. If you go to the Android Play Store and download uh, Mycelium, it's M-Y-C-E-L-I-U-M. Um, another one is blockchain. Uh, that works on Android and uh, iPhones. Yeah, that's what I use. Right. So. Uh, and there's even, one, there's yeah, even like good. you can print out paper wallets at uh, bitaddress.org. Kind of um, nice. So anyway, so you have to have a uh, get a get a Bitcoin wallet by next episode, mm -hmm. and uh, you'll get your fair share of uh, Bitcoins. So right. Money so to yeah. be made. And so to, keep that, so to keep that in mind, the next episode, that there'll be $100 in Bitcoins that we're going to be giving to whoever has wallets. So we'll split them evenly. But if there's only one person in the room, then they get all $100. And then the more yeah. of you, they just split it. So all you have to do is download an app and really get paid next episode. So yeah. you guys got the inside thank track. You. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, sure. Cool. All right. Well, thank you guys very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. I'm looking forward to the APM. Buy one, man. Yeah, I mean,
I know, know, right? Like, they're flying everywhere tonight. So for the events this week, we wanted to focus on community-driven events. Now, it's always been a myth in Las Vegas that there's no such thing as communities here, and we're out to prove that wrong tonight by telling you about some of the events that get people together and making a difference in our community, and especially our downtown community. So the first event that I'm going to talk about is the Greetings from Las Vegas event, and that's going to be on the 5th of December. However, the application deadline for getting into this is actually happening next week so you need to get your application in by the 4th of October now what you'll be applying for is uh, the Greetings from Las Vegas event is going to be renting the Gateway Motel at Charleston and Las Vegas Boulevard, and they're going to rent up to 20 different rooms. And these rooms are going to be showcasing um, the community in Las Vegas, and they're going to be showcasing their um, sustainability and their greener kind of projects, um, and just showing how we're making it a more greener and sustainable Las Vegas, which is very, very cool. So it can feature installations or displays of any creative medium by individuals, pairs, groups, or official organizations. So if that sounds like you, if you're working on an, an initiative like that and you want to have some community outreach, then definitely apply for this um, so that you can show off your stuff in the Gateway Ho Motel. So you can find out more on greetingsfromlv.com, and that's where you can apply and get the information. And the actual event is free, and it's curated, of course, and uh, it's free to actually have a booth as well. So it's no charge, and uh, I think the value is going to be pretty enormous. Yeah. That's great. Okay, so moving on to the Fashion Tech Hackathon. I know you've mm -hmm. got kind of the inside scoop, so you're going to spill the beans on what we can expect, maybe? I can give you a few clues. Um, so the Vegas Fashion Tech Hackathon is happening on the uh, Friday, the 4th of October. Now, just to warn you, the 4th, 5th, and 6th is featuring heavily in this night's event readout, so you're going to have a really busy weekend. So we're going to start with the Fashion Tech Hackathon, and you can find out more on VegasHack.com. But essentially, it's going to be unleashing your inner queue, which which is from, you know, James Bond, <laughs> um, to basically invent wearable tech and fashion apps. So it's a really cool idea, really cool weekend. Uh, it features everyone from developers to designers to marketers. So if you're a developer, you can come and code something. If you're a designer, you can kind of reconcile the form versus function and help the coders create something that's really beautiful. And if you're a marketer, you can come and help them pitch their idea at the end to try and win the prizes. So there's definitely something in it for everyone. And uh, I hear there's a few interesting projects being worked on. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's yeah, the beans. I know, like, I'm well, sorry. You, I, I want to know. I was trying to get suspense. Um, All these facts. Yeah, like, <laughs> tell me the juice. So the juice is, I hear that someone is working on some rather innovative underwear. So if you'd like to see that happening. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you mean? What do you mean innovative underwear? There's improvements to be Very made down there? clever, inventive underwear. Do you need any innovation? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly don't know. I think you're going to have to come down and have a look at what's going on. So I can't, I can't spoil their surprise because it is very cool. I did laugh a lot when I heard about the idea, so I'm very entertained by this. Um, there's also going to be something to do with music and clothing as well. So there's definitely something for everyone to see. Um, again, I'm particularly excited about this inventive underwear. So, yeah, yeah for, I'm those, definitely for those that. who are underwear, there's something to experience. Right, so experience. If, if you want to attend and participate in the hackathon, you can buy a ticket from VegasHack.com. Now, the ticket does include the keynote, the networking, the competition, breakfast, lunch, dinner, a t-shirt, like all sorts of stuff, including swag and prizes. So it's, very, it's a really good value hackathon, and it does kick off on the Friday night. So definitely look into joining up to that. Uh, the next one is the first annual Harvest Health Fair. So if hacking's not your thing, this is going to be happening on the same weekend. It's on the 5th of October. And they're putting together the power and purpose behind the term conscious living. So it's going to be starting in Summerlin. You're going to go for a, a short run or a casual walk with the downtown runners team to begin with. And then you're going to return and um, finish off at the Harvest Health Fair, which is brought to you by the Fit Labs Daily Kitchen and Las Vegas Cyclery. And it's basically focusing on really awesome food, uh, the latest in fitness and um, 
a wellness and conscious living. So it's actually really cool. You can come and eat. And if you'd like to walk across the street as well during that, there's the Gardens Park having the Summerlin Pumpkin Festival at the same time. Ooh. So there's so many awesome things to kind of eat. And I think you're going to be feeling very well at the end of the Saturday. So much so, by the way, you can get tickets for $15 off Ticket Cake. But if you're feeling extra well and you kind of want to ruin that a little bit. Yes, you want to ruin that health. <laughs> on the same day, on the Saturday the 5th again, we have the Grapes and Hops Festival. And that's going to be starting at 5 p.m. So there's plenty of time to get your health on during the day and uh, get your booze on at night. That's going to be held at Springs Preserve, which is a super pretty place, especially at 5 p.m. as the sun is setting. So you definitely want to get down to this. You're going to be joining wine connoisseurs and beer enthusiasts from throughout southern Nevada. Now, it's going to be raising money for a really great cause. The cause is called Par for the Cure, and it's a benefit organiza uh, sorry, a, a organization dedicated to raising funds for breast cancer. So super cool. Um, again, you have the perfect excuse to drink for charity. I love it. Nice. <laughs> and $35 for tickets in advance, or if you'd like to go with your significant other, it's only $60 for both of you to go. So that sounds like pretty good value for me. You do actually get um, unlimited wine, beer, and food samples. So that's pretty good value to me. Uh, you can find out more information on springspreserve.org. Coming up next is the 555 Downtown Las Vegas Dinner. Right. Now, Dylan, you've been yeah, to one of these before, right? right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but yeah, but they have different chefs doing each one of the courses, and it was an awesome Excellent. experience. I mean, the place was jam-packed, and I met a lot of great people. Well, that sounds awesome. So yeah. they're doing it again, and that's going to be on the 13th of October, so you do have a bit of a rest from that crazy weekend. And the next weekend, you can come to this. Um, it's brought to you by the Vegas Real Food Project, and this time it's called Dinner on the Farm. So it's actually going to be held on a farm instead of in downtown Las right. Vegas. Uh, it's held fun. at the Cowboy Trail Farms, which I heard is a really cool place to really comforting and, and lovely. And their dinner on the farm, um, the funds that they raise from that is going to go towards the Project 150, which is a charity dedicated to assisting the homeless and disadvantaged high school students, which is a really super awesome cause. Like, yeah. I think that's really important. So um, yeah, the Meet the Neighbors starts at 5.30 p.m. on that night, and 6 p.m. is when the food all starts coming out, and it's five course meals, so that's really awesome. You can buy tickets on Ticket Cake. Now, I'm actually very privileged tonight to be sitting in between my two favorite Dylans. <laughs> yeah, you're in the Dylan Sanders. So the next... <laughs> what? That's what? He came up with that one. I just I copied it because it. it's funnier well, than I can I'm, think oh, of. I'm the fat kid. No, I say <laughs> well, I love you guys. You guys are awesome. And uh, Dylan's here to talk about Rails Rumble. And that's run by the Las Vegas Ruby Users Group. And I have actually gone down to a meeting since I spoke to Judd a few episodes ago. Really, really cool. You guys are really inviting, very welcoming, and very smart, too. The talks were really awesome. So you're going to be having like an entire 48-hour event soon? Tell me about that. We are. Actually, it's an international event. It's not wow. just, just the uh, Las Vegas Ruby group. Okay. It's every Ruby developer internationally. There's going to be 500 teams, okay. and you have 48 hours from Friday at 5 to Sunday at 5. Just that's your, that's your box that you have to play in. And it has to be a rack app, um, which Rails is a rack app. So there's more to Ruby than just Rails. So, oh, okay. <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, yeah. It's, it's going to be a good time. I mm -hmm. mean, there'll be a lot of uh, hashtag Ruby and hashtag Rails going on. So, <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, definitely watch out for Twitter because, you know, it's kind of a running commentary. It's you like know, a live feed. People are like, look at this and uh, wow, that. And is there going to be like prizes and things like that? There are prizes at the end. Last year, one of our team placed ninth, so that was pretty impressive. Out of 500 teams internationally that our local group uh, placed ninth. It's going to be at wow. Cobiz, uh, okay. which is on Tanay and Rainbow. Fantastic. So it's a great co-working space, and everyone's invited to come hang out and, and um, hack on some code. There's going to be teams between one and four, and you know, may the best team win. Okay, so there's a deadline for registering, though, right? There oh, is. There's a challenge in there. Like, yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, that it seems fair, is it? Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's, this packed, it's uh, on this packed weekend on Friday the 4th is mm -hmm. when you have to volunteer or sign up for it. Okay. You can go to our uh, uh, LV, lvrug.org, okay. and that will redirect to our meetup group, and it's going to be posted on there. Fantastic. So, yeah. And uh, we want to show the rest of the world that, yeah, Las Vegas has an awesome tech community, we so do. we definitely want to place. Again. Again. That would be awesome. Yeah, hopefully we can move up that list. Uh, what we're looking for, though, is designers. We have a lot of smart people, but we really need... Uh, designers. You're saying designers aren't smart, Dylan? Come no, on. no, 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 no. <laughs> it's, oh, yeah. it's a different, different skill set. Ah, gosh, yeah. Yeah, foot in the mouth. I told them I wouldn't do this. Uh, <laughs> no, like, you know, it, we have some great designers, but you, you need that other side. Like, you can make the best app in the world, but if it just looks like Twitter bootstrap, you're yes. not going to win. Yeah, so that's very true. we need some creative people to come and, and, and help us out. And so if you're, if you're down to do this, please come and check us out. It's a great opportunity, great time. 
Very cool. Yeah, I can I can definitely say that the the community is really welcoming. So anyone who's never been to a like a Las Vegas Ruby group meetup, um, it doesn't matter. You should still definitely get down for that and join up with the team. Well, thank you. I look forward to hearing about the results of that event as well. It's going to so be awesome. I. Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate thank you. it. And that's the event for this week. I think so. Yeah, qualify for the acting academy. I think he could teach. Okay, so so what we're gonna do in a second is uh, I'm gonna jump into a character, and he's actually gonna do an interview with me. But first off, let me introduce who our next guest, Tony Plana. This could be one of your first podcasts. I think it is. It is my first. Yeah. So welcome to the new the new media. I like it. Thank you. Okay. But so back in the day, he was in 62 major motion pictures, including and over 200 TV episodes. Some of the notable roles were uh, the Academy Award winning Officer and a Gentleman. You were Ugly Betty's dad on the hit ABC TV show, and uh, you were also on Seinfeld, 24, Desperate Housewives, and then the coolest thing I thought. Actually, I got the. uh, You guys haven't seen. Check him out in the newest movie, Pain and Gain, which is now on DVD. Um, you actually had a, an awesome role in this, and this movie, I heard, has been doing a great job. And Amazing. But you missed my favorite credit. Oh, what's your favorite one? I, you I have so played, many to go through. I played the Mexican bandit El Jefe in Three Amigos. Oh. <laughs> how, did, how did that slip by? How did that slip by? It, it, it requires some real method acting. <laughs> Me and Steve Martin went toe to toe. So, uh, but you actually have a personal passion for education, and that's what I want to talk about today. So, you created the East LA Classic Theater in Los Angeles, which is a um, it's a it's a school that actually teaches by using the arts, right? So, I know you described it when in a pre-interview as sort of the place where arts and science kind of merge. It's a yes. new way of thinking about the way that we we learn. I, I think we should dive into and see if they can maybe apply it to the downtown community. So let's hop into it. Okay, uh, I, it started from kind of a Hollywood Shuffle experience. You know what that? You know what I mean by that? You ever seen the movie by Robert Townsend called Hollywood Shuffle? It's about the black experience in Hollywood. You okay. know, and and what I mean by that is that a lot of us who had the equivalent of you know bachelor's and master degrees in 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 uh, in college, you know, would show up at these casting sessions pretending we were gang members. Okay. And none of us had been gang members, except that we put on these fake tattoos and hair nets and bandanas and, right, right. you know, and then I go, we go to each other like, you know, like, you know, Carnegie Mellon. Yeah, yeah. Like, and then know, we just. Or, oh, we go, we go, Juilliard, brother. Right, right, right. You know, and, and so, and, but, but that's, that, that was the, you know, when we started back in the day, which was like middle 70s, late 70s, that's the kind of roles that, that you know, African Americans and Hispanic Americans were, you know, were asked to read for, were asked we're to play. Were stereotyped for, yeah. Were stereotyped. Gotcha. So yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of us from Juilliard, I went to RADA in London, Carnegie Mellon, a lot of my friends who were African American and black, who had to pretend we were gang members to be on television, we um, we had all been trained in Shakespeare. So right. one of the, one of the cool things we did is we wanted to create Shakespeare uh, adaptations and present them f- to minority children. And what we did is we started setting up like um, workshops to introduce the kids to the plays, so they could understand the plot, and then we would talk to the kids after the plays. You know, okay, yeah, after yeah, performing yeah. them. And we, we realized how cool it was for actors and children to get together. It's like I told you, right. uh, actors are children trapped in <laughs> yeah, adult true, bodies. Yeah. So <laughs> they go their imaginations. Yeah, right. Yeah, so like that, yeah. you know, you're, you know uh, uh, actors are playful adults and children are playful. Right. Um, so we really, we really uh, keyed into that chemistry. And we wanted to extend the time we spent with children, and we looked for ways where we could help the children do better in school. And one of the ways that we felt we had, um, um, you know, we could best contribute would be to um, help the children develop better communication skills. Right. So we, we, we thought about the whole idea of, of combining the performing arts with learning language, because a lot of them have language issues. We thought the performing arts were the best way to, you know, um, to do this, and and 
this is 15 years ago. Right. You know, so we were right, ahead right, of the curve yeah. in, in exploring this area. And the more the more we got into it, the deeper we got into it, the more convinced we were that we were on the right track. Right. And, well, and that's what I loved about it, because all this neuroscience now is pointing towards how powerful the imagination is for getting over this. But you guys really were doing it before everyone yeah, else. So you got the and, best. Yeah. And we yeah. did. And we found out that most of your dropouts are kinesthetic learners, meaning that they have to interact with what they're learning. Right. That they can't just sit in a desk and learn yeah, auditorily yeah. and then process the information and Regurgitate. Brim Van Winkle's a story. So if, if he was asleep for 100 years and he came back today, the place where he'd still be most comfortable would be today's classroom. Because it hasn't changed in 100 years. It's right. still one person in front of a blackboard speaking to people in desks and communicating information. So we right. said, let's throw away these desks throw away the chairs, and change up the dynamics in the classroom. You know? I love it, I love and, it, yeah. And, and, and have the classroom be as interesting, entertaining, engaging as the outside world, where they have amazing uh, screens and phones and computers and, and video games. The classroom, like make them want to go to school. Exactly, yeah, because saying, the yeah. classroom has to compete with the outside world. You, you can't expect people who live in the outside world that are super interesting and engaging and interactive come into a classroom and not be interactive. How can that be attractive to them? Right. And forced to learn in a certain way that they're not ready to yeah. learn. So the dropouts, 90% of them, are kinesthetic learners. They can't learn the way we're trying to heal. That's where they're dropping out. Right. African-American children and, and Latino children are, are experiencing four to five times the disciplinary actions. Oh, wow. of their counterparts. Why? They're bored or challenged in the classroom and they can't process. Right. So they get in trouble and they're put on a, on a, on a railroad right to jail. <laughs> so they're, they're going, they're, a lot of them are being incarcerated yeah. eventually yeah. and that's costing society uh, on so many levels. I mean, right. not just in terms of wasting human resources, but also, you know, like uh, having right. to cost us to incarcer incarcerate them when there's like a hundred thousand dollar difference between incarcerating someone and not making right. them productive citizens. If they're productive and they're educated, they're contributing, you know, right. uh, $30,000 a year per person on the average in terms of income tax, property tax, and sale tax. Right. And if you Not put them in prison, it costs better, you 50, yeah. 60,000. If you add it up to get aggregately, you know, you're spending 90 to 100,000 to incarcerate somebody yeah. as opposed to Contributing a hundred thousand. And I just, want more, I just want more people to be happy too. Like I want people to like enjoy learning. You know? Right. So, and so like, my my contention yeah. is that we need to teach these people and have them learn the way they're wired to learn. Right. And we're not doing that. Okay. Well, let's talk. So if you've been doing this fifteen years, how has the curriculum changed over this time, and what have you learned about the way people the, the way people learn? The like, way it has changed is that it, we have tied it to standards. So everything we do in, the, in, in that lesson plan every day has a connection to a standard that they're trying to achieve. Our goal was to legitimize, validate performing mm -hmm. arts as a teaching tool. Because when we, were, we went in there first, they said, oh, performing arts, that's like enrichment. It's like, you know, touchy-feely, <laughs> right. so The first thing you yank when you yeah, have that money. Yeah, right. that's well, that's, right. I was yeah. telling you last night that what's yeah. amazing is that if you have a low-performing school, they pull all the arts. So it becomes an even more boring place to go to school. Right. You know, why not flood it with the arts, have the kids love to go there, mom, dad, I'm going to school to play, right, you know? Right. And like I said, you know, that when we're children, that's how we, that's how we learn. We find a bottle and we go and we check it out, we, you know, feel it, and touch it and play with it, create different things with it, you know? That's right. how we learn. And that, that play instinct to, you know, that's part of learning becomes slowly kind, kind of um, ripped out of us as we become more institutionalized in school. And is that what you were talking about, being actually emotionally connected to your school? You well, we, right, we, like we toys, feel you know? that the, the factor that they've identified as the one factor that is most important in, in that's missing in the dropouts who drop out of school is an emotional connection to the school, an identification with the school. Right. Like, I, I, I like going there because... <sighs> I'm emotionally connected. I, I want to go there and, 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 and I'm, that's part of my identity. Right. And if that doesn't happen, then they start to withdraw and slowly but surely they start to look for other places to belong. And they right. get in, involved with the wrong people, the wrong kinds of activities, and, and we lose them.
Right. You know, so for me, um, it seems like we're skipping that step. And if you talk to savvy educators, they know exactly what I'm talking about. You have to find a way to have that child connect with the school experience, right. connect with the learning. And my contention is that That's if true, we yeah. can get them to learn the way they're wired to learn, then eventually we can get them to learn in different ways. Right. You know, and, and develop, you know, the other uh, uh, intelligence muscles that, that, that are there, so to speak. Yeah, well, it's difficult what you're putting them through. So, okay, so before we go into our little role play here, I want you to talk about the different programs. So you have language in play, yeah. you have teaching in play, and then you have the co program. Uh, maybe you just touch on what those three different programs language are. Language in play is exactly that. As we talked, uh, we start with the process of these kids learning um, about themselves. So we become extremely curious and inquisitive about who they are. So I go, Dylan, who yes. are you? Where are you from? Yeah, that would be an interesting question. Yeah, and so Joe, I want you to write that. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know. It frees up in front of all these people. Well, no, there, but that's what no, happens. Yeah. They, a lot of them say, yeah. I don't know, or uh, what do you mean? Or no one's ever asked them about themselves. And yeah. we feel, especially when it comes to developing language, that the key to developing language is to uh, te teach them or have them learn from the inside out. Right. You know, so instead of teaching them from the outside in and throwing a textbook at them and saying, here, yeah, learn some English, and, you know, yeah. okay, <laughs> you know, what is this? To say, to start, have them look at themselves introspectively, write in journals, and out of the journal comes the desire right. to write, to, to speak, and to, you know, to Right, to communicate. learn English so you can solve a problem that you have inside your head. Right? That's exactly right. And to start to, to get to know them, and we call it identity building and strengthening, right? So okay. it's, you start to build their personal and their cultural identity. And, and they, take, they start to take pride in that and, and become very secure with who they are and what makes them special, what makes them unique. You right. know? And they start to write that in their journals. We respond to them in the journal. We prompt them. We prompt them with ideas to think about for themselves. And eventually, we start to uh, get them to create a personal narrative. This is who I am. This is where I was born. These are my parents. They come from this country. I live in this uh, neighborhood. This is what it's like. Probably just by sharing that, they start connecting, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And that. they start to understand their differences and similarities between them. And right. so the classrooms become an interdynamic place. And it's un unpredictable as to what will happen. We change the way that the teacher relates to the students, the students relate to themselves, the, 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 to each other, and to themselves. And, and all that is 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 part of the the very the varying dynamics of how you want them to create language especially verbally you know when you're learning a new language and we we learn, we work a lot with latino kids who uh who you know are learning english uh english is their second language and the key to being functional in a language is to speak it right. but we teach we unfortunately we teach language to these kids ass backwards we're teaching them how to write and read first and hoping that they'll speak it Oh, yeah, and so saying, by yeah. getting them into pseudo immersion scenarios where we improvise, we play games, we role play, we, we, we have all kinds of improvisations. Pretend you're an animal. Yeah. Exactly. In those immersions, they yeah. have to use English. And so out of the, nice. the fun and the play of interacting, language is developed. Yeah. Or language skills are developed. And, and that's, that's, that's how um, we get them to, uh, in a sense, get more comfortable with themselves, share themselves through language, and become much more uh, communicative and interactive in the classroom. Okay. All right. So we're gonna run through this now. I'm, uh, you know, my language in English is okay. So we're gonna we're gonna move past that. But what I wanted to do I is I noticed that. Yeah. yeah. Well, look, it's okay. It's not good. But uh, so you had me um, find an animal that I wanted to learn about. I changed yes. it to an insect. So I decided that I wanted to learn about bees. Cool. So I um, I've been studying it, uh, but not in a normal way. Not just like going to Wikipedia. But what I was trying to do is say, if I was a bee, right. How would my life be? Right. So I'm, and uh, let me set that up in the sense yeah. that we ask these kids. A lot of them are very shy. They're afraid to share themselves. So to, in order to get them out of themselves, we ask them to choose an animal. Right. And to become that animal and learn everything they can about the animal. And so um, then we, do, we put them through interviews where they're interviewed as the animal. Right, which right? is what we're about to do now. And it actually, in a sense, allows them to be less shy and they start, they start to, to be comfortable with, with communicating in public. So um, I'm, we're going we're gonna to yeah. pretend that you're, you're, you're a bee and I'm going to interview you. Okay, let me go into character again. 
Okay, I think I'm there. It's a pleasure to meet you. Hi, I'm George Lopez. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm late night host of this interview show, and I'm very happy to have you, a B, on our program. Right. Have yeah, you ever been me. interviewed on a program before? No, we have, uh, as a B, we have pretty short, busy lives. Right. So we haven't. So tell us, <laughs> we're, 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 yeah. we're very, you know, see, they're laughing. They're, they're curious about, they've never really heard a B yeah. speak before. Yeah, no. You know? <laughs> yeah, but well, we're fascinating. We do I, a lot of interesting things. That I know. Well, listen, help, let's, let's just start with, first of all, where do you live? Like, what, what kind of a place do you live? Where okay. You live? It's a crowded place compared to where you guys probably live, but I live yeah. inside a beehive. Yeah. I've got, uh, Thousands of brothers and sisters, thousands and thousands of them, oh. and we have uh, three types of bees. We have a we have a queen bee, just just one. One, right? And I'm who's her husband? Uh, uh, well, there's about one thousand potential husbands. Really? Yes. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, <laughs> they're called. That's that's one happy bee. <laughs> they're they're, they're called, female bee. <laughs> they're called the uh, they're called the drone bees, and I. Uh, oh. Oh, I'm a, I'm a worker bee, so actually, oh. I'm a female, too. You're a female? I didn't think about that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> actually, yeah, there's only, yeah, almost we're all females, all us, us worker bees. And then us worker that's bees. Right. I never also, told you you had yeah. to be your sex, so that's interesting. Yeah, I recently got promoted to a forager, which is wow, the, the forager. top of the chain. Yeah. So you're, you're not a drone. Thank you, thank you. You're not a drone. <laughs> no, no. That's, you're a that's, worker. I'm a and worker you've been bee, promoted yes. to? I've been to forager. So okay, so what do you do as have, a forager? Uh, as a forager, that means I'm allowed to leave the beehive and uh, actually go out and collect nectar. And I take the nectar, and I, I, I have a special second stomach that I use that I don't actually. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> but uh, we, I store nectar in there and actually don't digest it. Um, I, I bring it back to the to the hive. Wow. And then what happens to <laughs> what you bring undigested to the hive? Uh, well, I mean, I mean, the cycle is eventually that it becomes honey. So I take, um, I, I fill my pouch up, I jump from flower to flower, and I fill it with nectar, and then I go back, and then there's another... Uh, now, nectar, what, how is nectar different from pollen? Uh, uh, okay, so, so pollen, yeah, actually, we don't, the, the, this is a good question, because the yeah. pollen affects uh, everybody and, and the whole ecosystem. But coincidentally, we're not actually too concerned with pollen. We just happen to catch it on our hind legs. And then as we jump from flower to flower, we end up dropping some off and mixing it, and, and that's how flowers. Um, so what do you eat, for example? Do you eat um, your own honey, or what? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. So I can I can eat some nectar if I want a little bit of energy. But, okay. Um, I can also go back and actually eat the honey. So we take we I have this you know this sack that I fill with with it. I go back and then um, there's a, there's another group of bees that wait at the front entrance to the beehive. I've got a friend friend named Sally, and what I do is I regurgitate my. Um, my nectar into her pouch, and then she goes, uh, she goes off, and then she um, puts it inside one of the honeycombs, which I'm sure you've seen. Now, now, how does Sally feel about that? Uh, well, that's her. That's her cycle. Eventually, she'll make it to be. Is she happy about it, or she just does it because she has to? Um, we don't she really. Enjoy yeah, it yeah, well, well, the thing is, when we're born, the second we get out of our thing, we just start cleaning it, and then when we're done with that, we become uh, her position, where we like take the honey from forager bees. Now, did and you then choose Sally, or did Sally choose you? Yeah, we go way back. Oh. We go. We go way back. Yeah. <laughs> I used to. I used to do her job, but I got. I got promoted. <laughs> oh, this is it's, like, it's a girl girl thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's well. It, I mean, it's not sexual. We just. Uh, we just regurgitate. Sounds nectar pretty to each intimate, other. though. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, regurgitating into each other is, is uh, not exactly, you know. It's um, surprisingly common in my world, but yeah. Is it? Yeah, I bet. <laughs> now, listen, I, I'm just wondering, like, in terms of, like, you, do you have any fears as a bee? I mean, do, do you, are there, are there, do you have a, like, a, a, the person you most fear? Now, who would that be? Bears have really tough skin, so oh. they can just. Grab us, and you don't though, like bears. Even though we, even though we sting them, they don't, uh, they don't usually care. care too much unless right. we, yeah, get them in the eye or something. And but. who, and it's who, who is your, your, your? And you have a, that's your enemy. Who's your, your best friend? Oh, oh, the bee's best friend. Yeah. Um, well, you know, there's a bunch of different types of bees. So I'm a honeybee, right? But there's also, um, there's also the bumblebee, which you may have heard of, right, and they're. Yeah, yeah. They're kind of stupid, but like they, uh, they they're noisy too. Yeah, they just they're they just, noisy. they're not quite they're quite, quite as they're efficient loud. as us. Yeah, they're, they're not loud. quite as efficient as us. And right. um, uh, and then of course we have we have all the wasps, which uh, right. are not too big fans Ooh, of they're wasps. Nasty. They're nasty. Uh, yeah, especially with some damage. They're like the bad guys in movies, the wasps. Yeah, right? yeah. Well, and especially now now, now that uh, all you humans are flying all over the world, you're bringing wasps from areas where they weren't before into places where we live. They're messing you up. And, uh, and they're messing you up because that, now we're not pollinating flowers and eventually that goes all the way up the food That's chain. That's true. 
Now, tell me a little bit about, um, uh, do, you, do you guys, what do you do on Saturday nights? Do you guys go dancing or what do you do? Um, do, you, do you do any drinking, anything like that? Well, we literally work around the clock until we die four months later. <laughs> so we don't, we don't, I don't know. Doesn't, we, sound, doesn't <laughs> sound like a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, we. Finally, um, on, on like, how do you like celebrate? You you do any dancing or oh, singing yeah. or? I don't know if you heard. We're famous for our dances. I actually. just wonder. We, you know, I've we, heard about it, but we, yeah, we communicate uh, through through dance and math actually. So we do dance and dance and what? And math. We we kind of mix the two depending okay, on how we dance. Okay, explain that to me. Yeah. So the uh, um, what do you guys call? It? I think you call it a twerking. Is that what? Yeah, you <laughs> you guys dance right? <laughs> we do. I, I don't I don't twerk. <laughs> Okay, well, we do, uh, we do You'll something. You'll never see me twerk. Yeah, we, we, do, we do something kind of similar, and then um, depending on how we do it, it can actually tell the people who are watching us dance uh, everything from how many meters away uh, food sources or resources. We can tell them where to turn. We can tell them how big the resource wow. is. And in fact, we can even uh, we can do measurements based on how fast we're flying, and we have uh, all sorts of amazing things that we can communicate. Is that how dances. it relates to math? Uh, yeah, so that's yeah. So we're really big. By into dancing, geometry. dancing is a way of communicating measurements right. and distances and uh, what yeah. else? Anything else? Or? Um, that's it. We don't communicate emotions or anything. So it's just the drones, just the mad. drones don't yeah. dance with the queen before we, they. <laughs> no, we just uh, be, yeah, we just be twerk information. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Okay, okay. All right. I'm gonna drop out of character. No, you, yeah, please, because uh, <laughs> you're, you're, you're making me tired. <laughs> Tired, Dylan. <laughs> I'm ready so to die in about four guys, months. Yeah. Um, uh, that's funny. But yeah, but you know, you know what? It's, it's an amazing way to learn. It actually is. It, it was surprising how much more effective it was. And I would love to see this program, this East LA Classic Theater kind of program, come downtown, especially with our Inspiration Theater coming up. And I always have the Learning Village and a number of uh, kind of forward thinking education people around here. So Great. Um, yeah, I want to make sure that the audience checks out uh, the website. So you can go to eastlaclassic.org if you want to learn more about this program. And then on Twitter, um, yeah, Twitter you got East LA Classic, and then on Facebook you have East LA Classic Theater. So right, um, yeah. And is, so is just, me, just to, to you know yeah, to please, finally don't. answer your, your question, that language and play is the is the program we've designed, the curriculum we've designed for the students, you know, right. at all levels, elementary, middle school, and high school, uh, according to grade level. And then we have the tap or the teaching as play, and and the the uh, the uh, the motto of that program is stop teaching start playing, <laughs> yeah. okay? So it's teaching us play so that we teach the teachers how to use our techniques as actors and theater uh, practitioners, how to use that in the classroom. And then the last one that you, that you mentioned, COPE, is right. for parents. And we also involve parents in playing and role playing. And you know, through that uh, methodology, we, we help them to become better parents. Yeah. It's called uh, Creating Opportunities for Parent Effectiveness, well, COPE. 15 yeah. years, man. You've made a big difference in the world, so I really oh, appreciate you coming out. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, good job. That was fun, man. You did a great job. Oh, thank you. All right, so we're going to close the show out by jumping to Susan, and she's going to have our last question of the evening. So we have Dan Hugo here, right? What's yeah, your Twitter does. handle? Uh, strangely enough, it is Dan Hugo on Twitter as right. well. And Dan is actually new to the Las Vegas community, so we want to show him a warm welcome first. Yeah. yeah. And I have a question for Dan that's related to the Fashion Hackathon that we were talking about before. And my question is, if I actually, first, are you attending the Hackathon? Uh, fashion is very important to me, as you probably have guessed, so I'm, <laughs> I can't imagine not going. OK, all right. So even if you aren't going, let's say you are. What would you invent during the Fashion Hackathon weekend? Uh, I had about a minute to think about this, and many years ago, Compaq actually had some device, and I would go in this direction. We come across so much stuff through our day, and uh, smartwatches, I think, may eventually head in this direction. Things on you that aren't a phone, but are, that you can wear on you in any form factor that will collect and gather stuff in your travels. So you can go later and say, what was that guy's name? And Google Glass, maybe, sort of, as well, but uh, maybe less creepy. <laughs> a little, but but more like maybe stuff that's kind of shot at you, and you can go back later and say which food truck did I go to, which 
which book was I, you know, any, anything in through your, through your day, because there's just too much. It's uh, the equivalent of scraps of paper in your pockets, I think, uh, something like that. I like that idea a lot. It's very, very practical. How, how would you make it be less creepy? Uh, not as obvious. The smartwatch thing, I think, will be sort of a, it'll be kind of a fashion statement for a little while, but this will be literally a thing that's in your pocket, almost like the, uh, uh, is it Fitbit, I think, that, that just kind of clips on your belt, or the, I saw somebody with an up band I used to work in job on. Uh, so um, just something that's sort of passively on you. It's not so obvious. But it's just kind of collecting data through the day. And I think, uh, what is it, personal big data, small data, I think they're calling it. So something in that direction, yeah. Not, not so obvious. I like the idea. I'm terrible at parties. I'm too busy being anxious to remember everyone's name. So I will definitely be your number one beta tester. All right. Thank you. Right. Cool. Okay. Thanks, and I'll see you next week. Hashtag.